all right so good morning and welcome to today's uh, lecture so we are going to continue where we left off yesterday what we had sort of ended with was a view of hardware where we could separate out a so called data path from the control right so what we have is essentially some kind of a system where we have something that at the moment i just call a data path and i have a controller whose job is basically to send control signals to the data path i have inputs that come in from somewhere either from the external world or from some storage devices which could include a register file or memory i'll just group these together into some form of storage i could have my outputs going into the storage or my inputs also coming in from there and the controller's job is basically to send control signals to the data path as well as to this storage to basically decide what gets read when it is read how the data is processed and so on okay so like i said this sort of puts pretty much all the effort of managing things properly on the controller the controller needs to keep track of when enable signals need to be sent to the different modules when should i give a read enable signal to the memory when should i give a write enable <coughs> signal what address should be sent where at which point in time right so if you think about it ultimately that controller can be visualized as probably a set of multiplexers with the corresponding enable signals or select signals being generated by the controller right and the controller is just doing some logic equations it basically compares some values if a counter is equal to something send one control signal somewhere else etc okay so in principle this is doable right how exactly do you implement something of this sort in hardware is something that we need to probably go into a little bit more detail right so there are two issues over here one of them is with regard to how the controller itself gets implemented right which will be part of your second assignment right the other one is if i don't really want the controller to be involved in every single step of this process and i want part of the computation to be data driven so to say is there a way that i can do that okay so let's start with how i would implement and or rather one way by which i could implement a controller right and you will need to use this for your second assignment which i will get to in a moment but uh, apart from that process of how to implement the controller the next thing that we will be looking at is how can i have a sort of self driven data path so if you look at what the controller is doing right let's take an example and in order to make the example a bit more concrete what i am going to say is i'll i'll use the assignment that you are going to be asked to solve which is basically implement a sequential divider okay so what is a divider essentially i have two inputs i'll call them a and b right and these i'm going to write are 31 colon 0 now this 31 colon 0 is the very log syntax that is used in order to indicate that this is a 32 bit value okay so the 31 refers to the msb the 0 refers to the lsb 31 colon 0 essentially says this is a 32 bit value okay it's not exactly i mean the very log syntax does not exactly correspond to this this is not how you will write it but please look that up we will be sending out some references for how to write verilog and how to test your basic verilog codes but this part you are expected to learn on your own okay but the 31 colon 0 is i'm just going to use it as a shorthand to indicate 31 is the msb the most significant bit 0 is the lsb therefore this is a 32 bit value both a and b are 32 bit values for the output what i want is x is equal to a divided by b okay and what i'm going to assume over here is just do integer division 
right don't worry about the fractional part don't worry about the remainder etc all that i care about is the quotient after doing in integer division okay so examples of that would be Ten by three is equal to three, right? Ignore the uh, remainder, right? One hundred by three would be equal to thirty-three. One by three would be equal to zero, etc. Okay. Minus five divided by three. This is a bit more tricky. What you are actually expected to do, depending on the you know the direction in which you sort of round downwards and so on. you might think that it's actually minus 1.6 but normally what is expected over here is that this is minus 2 right because minus 5 the what we would like to have is the remainder is always a positive number less than the divi uh, divisor okay so in which case basically minus 5 becomes minus 2 times 3 plus 1 okay so from that point of view minus 5 divided by 3 is minus 2 it's basically minus 1.6 rounded down to the nearest integer and the remainder would be you know, the whatever is left after that right so this is fairly standard and in fact what i'm going to suggest is there are some fairly standard algorithms for doing division right there are uh, you can just look them up there is something called uh, the restoring and the non restoring division algorithms right effectively what they are doing is what you would have done if you were learning division in whichever class we learned division which i have forgotten right uh, which is you start off by estimating the first digit of the coefficient of the quotient right subtract that out then continue subtract out the next digit of the quotient next digit of the quotient etc etc you build up the answer successively right so these algorithms are fairly simple and easy enough to understand and in binary it turns out that they are actually easier than decimal division okay but i'm not going to go into the algorithms in detail that's not the point of this assignment please look up feel free you know wikipedia whatever other sources that you can think of to find out a suitable algorithm i'm not saying you need to necessarily use this what i care about is if i give you two 32 bit values you should be able to divide a by b and give me the answer okay and there are ways by which you can do this in one step that is to say you can basically do a complete combinational divider right but the combinational divider is probably i mean it is not what is expected over here what i expect is actually a sequential division okay so what do i mean by a sequential division basically what i'm saying is after i give you the inputs you will take some number of clock cycles before you give me the answer okay now there are so if i look at this at the module level this is more or less what it looks like i have a piece of hardware okay that takes the following inputs there is a clock signal which is necessary for any sequential circuit there is also a reset signal which is once again required for any sequential circuit right the simple reason being that a flip flop by its very nature when you first provide power to it you don't know whether it's going to settle in the zero or the one state okay so when i switch on a system it could flip flop to either one of those states zero or one the reset signal is used to bring all of those flip flops to a known state okay so in general we will assume that you have a reset there can be some circuits which work even if you do not provide a reset but in general just for a safety as a, a principle of safety you need to provide reset to the uh, flip flops inside the circuit we will also have the two inputs a and b right these are 32 bits okay i use this notation where i just put a bar across the line and sometimes i can write 32 If I don't put a layer, if I don't write the number, it basically means it's a multi-bit value where I've not specified the number of bits. But if I put a number over there, it basically indicates, in this case, that it's a 32-bit value. Okay. And over here at the output, I have I'll call it x, which is once again going to be a 32-bit value. Right? Why does the output need to be 32 bits? How many bits should it actually be? That's something that is. 
you know actually depends on how you are doing the division but the point of the uh, question over here is if my input for example is the highest possible 32 bit value and if a is the highest possible 32 bit value and b is 1 then x is basically equal to a so it also needs 32 bits right in any other case you probably need less than 32 bits you definitely don't need more unless you are interested in the fractional path which we are going to ignore for now okay so this is what my divider module is going to look like okay so far so good the one question that comes up over here is i've just mentioned that my algorithm for division is going to take multiple clock cycles okay so if that is the case how do i know when to start when am i getting a new input and when should i finish okay there are two ways by which i can do this one of them is I can associate the start and done signal with the module itself. Right? So I give a separate start signal over here. The second is and after that I give a done signal at the end. <coughs> okay? So what does this mean? It basically means that apart from A and B, there is one more signal called start, and only when the start becomes equal to one, I should start doing my division algorithm. And once I have completed my algorithm, I generate a done signal. Okay, how would I implement something of this sort inside my divider circuit? I will have some logic which takes care of the actual subtractions and additions and so on, which are involved in the restoring division algorithm. But if I look only at the control part of it, one way that I can visualize this very nicely is I start off in something that I call an init state. Okay, I wait until start is equal to 1. I go into something that I will call a division 1 state. Right, The division 1 state will probably do some subtraction of values or something like that. From here, I actually don't look at any of the conditions. I don't look at start. Division 1 might do something as simple as taking the values of A and B and storing them into two registers. Right, That's up to you. I am not going to tell you how you should do it, but you could choose to do that. All that the division 1 state is, uh, does is to basically take the two values of A and B, store them into two registers. I then go into some other division 2 state, where I do something else. Maybe I have a counter, right? Here I increment the counter, do some arithmetic with a and b right and so on and so forth i could have multiple states out here right i could have like loop backs between the states etc but at some point i'll have one check one condition either counter goes to zero or some other condition some exit condition right i'm calling it an exit condition because basically it's telling me that my division is done get out okay and at that point i could go into another state where i basically call it the result state and over here i set done signal equal to 1 what do i do after this back to it okay so what i have drawn over here is essentially a finite state diagram finite state transition diagram okay in this case it's actually a very simple and almost a trivial kind of a finite state transition because you start from init the moment you get a start signal you go to div1 div2 div3 in pretty much in sequence and at the end of it you generate a done signal and go back to init okay so the state transitions over here are very simple but you can easily think of how this could have been more complex it could have been something that depended on the data it could have been something that depended on some other inputs and you could have ended up getting a more complex state transition diagram but the key point over here is it's a finite state machine and we know how to implement finite state machines in hardware okay so hopefully you still remember Mealy machines, more machines and so on. You don't need to know the distinctions between them. You don't need to know exactly what needs to be implemented in which way. 
you don't need to worry about how to minimize the number of states or the number of flip flops or anything of that sort the key point when you are using a language like verilog or some other higher level of synthesis technique is that you basically describe the functionality and leave the logic minimization to the tools that are just designed purely for that purpose right so the kind of things that we learn in basic digital logic such as you know how do i reduce a number of states or how do i reduce a number of flip flops you don't need to worry too much about it over here for the simple reason that that process can be automated if you remember your digital logic course part of the process over there was how do i automate this process how do i do it algorithmically and the moment you can do it algorithmically it means that a computer can do it better than you okay so in this case what we will be doing is you what you need to do is write the you need to decide the logic what are the set of states through which the system needs to proceed in order to do a division how does it process the start signal how does it generate a done signal okay and once you are done with that you just basically code it up in verilog put it into the compiler the compiler will translate that into logic equations and thereby to logic gates and actually create something that's going to get implemented in hardware okay the important thing to keep in mind over here is designing the state transition diagram is the part that the computer cannot do that's where you come in that's that's your job as designer okay <coughs> maybe at some point in time we might have computers that can also design these state machines to some extent it can be done in very limited cases already but in general that's the whole point of design that's that's the part that is not possible to automate okay so now what does this mean it basically means that if i have a sequential divider with all of these inputs and the start signal right it can process a start signal depending on when the start signal comes it will get out of the init state and start doing its computation once it has gone through a set of steps it will finally generate a done signal and then go back to the init state waiting for the next set of data okay this finite state machine that i have drawn over here will get compiled into some logic and if you think about it that is your controller as far as the divider is concerned okay so whatever i drew over here as saying that you know you will need some kind of controller is ultimately going to be some kind of state machine system okay in general when you have a programmable system this controller also gets inputs from memory from registers from the outside world it becomes a sort of programmable state machine the actual state transitions themselves can be modified by putting different values in different memory locations okay and if you think about it a programmable state machine is pretty much what a computer is a processor is okay so assignment 2 is basically going to be about this you need to implement this division algorithm using verilog uh sim and show that the entire thing simulates and also can be synthesized to hardware we will not actually be putting it on an fpga board and testing it out that will come a bit later okay but the entire simul up to simulation and synthesis you should be able to complete and demonstrate it working in hardware okay so now this also tells you about the fact that you know once i get the start signal and the uh, i start computing and the done signal basically tells me that i have finished okay this start and done signal are associated with the division module by itself okay so the external controller essentially has to say look i am going to give you a start say i i'll give you the data at some point a and b and afterwards i will provide the start signal you do some computation and eventually generate a done signal at that point i will take that x output and connect it somewhere else or you know tell the next stage that it needs to take data okay but another way of thinking about this is to associate the start and done signals in some ways with the data itself okay so what do i mean by that i'm going to look at it slightly differently i'll say that i have a module over here it takes in some data which is some multi bit value okay but rather than getting a separate start signal from the outside world i don't I, why did i need that start signal basically to tell me when the data is valid and when i should start computation okay 
So I could instead have associated that start signal with the data itself, something that just goes along with the data and says, yeah, you know, this is valid. It's just one bit. Okay. But I'm going to add one more signal over here, which is this module, right? May take multiple clock cycles to finish. During that time, I don't want multiple data to be coming in because I may not be able to handle them. So in other words, the moment I start doing one division, I need to tell the pre previous stage, stop, don't give me any more data. How do I do that? I send a ready signal back. Okay. On the other side, I have my out data which is once again some multi-bit value and here I generate an output valid. Okay. Which basically says whenever the output data is ready, that is I have finished my division, I have got the answer, this is the correct value, I will generate that output valid and put it over there. Okay. But then I have to decide, what should I do? Should I just put that data and the valid signal for one clock cycle and then move on to the next data? That's one way of doing it. But that's not really very good. Ideally, I would like to wait until I'm sure that whoever I'm feeding data to has actually read whatever I was providing. Okay? And how can I be sure of that? I get a ready signal from there. Okay? Right? Just to clarify things, I'll call this the in underscore valid, in underscore ready, and I'll make this the out underscore valid, and out underscore ready. Okay, You can see that in underscore valid is an input to my module, whereas out underscore valid is an output of my module. Similarly, in underscore ready is an output of my module going to the previous stage. Whereas out underscore ready is coming in from the next stage. Okay, What's the advantage of a system like this? What I can do with this is I can basically create one module, another module, a third module and the data valid ready data valid ready okay this system each of these blocks are working in a completely data driven manner what that means is whenever data is present at the input and is valid if my module is ready to operate it will take the data and start working as soon as it takes the data, it can set ready to zero. The in underscore ready, it can set it to zero to tell the previous stage, stop. Now don't give me any more data for some time. Okay. Once it is done, it will make out underscore valid high. At that point, it can choose. Either it can immediately make in underscore ready high so that it takes the next data or it can wait until the next stage actually reads out whatever it has generated. Okay. It makes out underscore valid high. If out underscore ready is high, great, it means that the next unit is basically going to read it immediately. That's the assumption. You make the assumption that as, as soon as the next stage says it is ready, it will immediately read your output. Right? As soon as it reads the output, you can pull your valid back down. And on the input side, you read in the next value and proceed. Okay? This kind of a setup is called handshaking. Right? And it's a sort of key component to implementing data driven pipelines. Effectively what we have done over here is we have created a pipeline of computational modules that are just sort of passing information from one to the other. Okay, So a data driven pipeline like this can be easily set up just by having these handshaking signals and the corresponding modules that communicate in this way. Okay. How do you implement each module internally? We just looked at that. There will be a finite state machine that is running inside each and every module. Okay. 
Now the key thing over here is, instead of having only one data, I might have data coming from two different places. I can use handshaking on both of them. And then my internal finite state machine has a choice. Either it waits for data to come in on all the different signals, or as soon as it comes on one of them, it does some computation, right? There are options that I have available over here, okay? So anyway, all of that is up to you. This particular interface that I described over here, right? The data valid ready, this is sometimes is a particular variant of something which is called the AXI stream interface. Okay, we'll sometimes just call it the axis interface, the axis stream interface. What does AXI refer to? It's some advanced extensible interface, something it doesn't matter, we'll get to all that later. The point is this is a bus protocol that was designed as part of the ARM processor system, right? And for our purposes, which is data driven computation, where the data itself tells you when you can start computation and move on to the next value, it's a great way of implementing things. Okay, so now as far as the division problem is concerned, we are going to see there are like uh, the way that the problem itself has been defined is like this. Okay, this is what the test bench for the divider looks like. Okay. So I'll just quickly go over some of the steps in this. For those of you who are not familiar with Verilog, it doesn't really matter. Please take the time to, you know, we'll share this over the mailing list. And we will also have a session on Monday where the TAs will be able to give you some clues, but they cannot teach you Verilog from the start. So please keep that in mind. You need to learn it on your own. They can help you with how to get started. The time scale, the first line of the test bench, you can, for the most part, ignore it. It is necessary in order to indicate what are the time steps that are being used internally. So when I mention some kind of a delay, a hash one, hash two, etc., the implication is that I'm talking about one nanosecond, okay? One very important thing to keep in mind, just because you wrote that something happens after one nanosecond in a very long code, does not mean it will happen that way in the hardware. The 1 nanosecond, 2 nanoseconds, etc. are not synthesizable. You cannot get an exact 1 nanosecond delay just by writing 1 nanosecond in Verilog. Okay? So, for the most part, in real Verilog designs, what you will find is people put <coughs> these numbers, hash 1, hash 2 and so on, but they will all be integers, they will never be, you will never have to depend on the actual value that you put in over there. If you do need to depend on the value that you put in over there, it means there is probably something wrong with your code. One place where you will find these things is in test benches and that is what I am showing you. What I am showing you right now is a test bench. Okay. This define width 32 is just a parameter, it is like a hash define in C. Okay. Then comes the first line of the actual Verilog module which is basically saying this is a module, a Verilog module whose name is seek underscore div underscore tb. Okay. So basically you read the name, you sort of get the idea. It's a test bench for a sequential divider. Okay, the underscore TB at the end indicates test bench. It is not mandatory, but it's usually a good idea to follow sort of standard conventions. Then you have a bunch of uh, variable declarations, so to say, right? Look through this. In particular, Verilog is a bit confusing. There is this concept of a register and a wire, right? Reg and wire rather. Reg actually has nothing to do with registers. It may get translated into flip-flops and physical registers, but there's no guarantee of that. It depends on how you have actually written your code, right? I personally consider that a confusing aspect of Verilog, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, you need to understand how it works and write the code accordingly, that's all. This part is where you actually declare the module under test, DUT, the device under test or design under test, okay? So DUT is again a common name. So seek underscore div is the name of the module. DUT is some identifier name that you are giving it inside your test bench, okay? This way of writing code, which is basically says that dot CLK within brackets CLK is what is called mapping the function parameter or module parameters, module arguments by name. 
okay so in other words it's saying the actual module has an input parameter called clk and i'm going to map the variable clk in my test bench to that okay always use this technique use named mapping of the arguments right the reason is because if you ever need to make a change in your verilog module the positions of the arguments can change and it's also possible to write it as dut within brackets clk reset a b ready etc okay without giving names just like in c normally how you would call a c function you would just give values to the parameters whereas those of you who have used python would probably know that you can do sort of passing by name right named parameter passing it's much safer to do it that way especially in something like verilog you should absolutely make it a habit to do it that way this step over here essentially declares a clock which is used inside your test bench right every 5 nanoseconds because my time scale was 1 nanosecond so that's why that hash 5 indicates 5 nanoseconds every 5 nanoseconds clock becomes inverted clock okay this task is something like a function call okay and is something that you should normally find only in test benches not in your regular verilog code in this case if you look closely at the task you will see that all that it's doing is it's giving you the ability to provide a set of inputs wait for a little while right and then once the valid signal or the output valid signal is uh, ready it basically exits the task okay and if you look closely at it that's exactly what is happening right it basically provides a reset signal makes the input ready zero right or rather the yeah and it basically makes a ready equal to 1 so that it can read in the value which is coming from the previous stage and waits until the output valid becomes high okay so this is effectively implementing a part of this handshaking that i had described over here okay not the entire system but a part of the handshaking it's not implementing the ready at the output for example okay and then you find that there's basically an initial followed by a set of statements that basically you know set two values for a and b call that task reset and crank dut and then display the output okay so i basically can try with a equal to 6 b equal to 3 a equal to minus 6 b equal to 2 etc etc i have a whole bunch of different options that i have over here okay which essentially is how you test a module that you have written right you give it a set of possible values and you check what the outputs are what outputs are being generated okay this is how a test bench in general is written if you notice the fft test bench in c was also fairly similar it basically in, instead of having all the data being coded into the main function it would basically say i'm going to read it from a file and compare the values that you finally generate okay so in other words this was just sort of an overview of what a verilog test bench looks like the assignment itself would involve writing this seek underscore div function over here okay and ideally of course what you should be able to do is also modify the test bench in such a way that you can give it different inputs and one key thing which is missing in this test bench is to make it a so called self checking test bench what does a self checking test bench do it would basically not only display the output it would also you know what the answer is so for example if i give 20 by 3 i know that the output should be 6 so i can actually read the output compare it against the known expected value and if there is an error directly print out that there is an error or indicate by some means that there is an error over here okay when you go to larger and larger designs the only way that you can actually manage a large design is to have a self checking test bench giving like three or four inputs and checking whether their values are correct will just not work in practice okay all right so let's get back to the uh, concepts that we were talking about over here the axis stream interface is a very powerful way by which i can do data driven computation what does that mean how do i use it when do i use data driven versus control driven computation right things of that sort we will look at later as we go for implementations okay 
so now i'm actually moving on to the next topic which is related to number representations okay so like i said for this assignment you are just being asked to deal with 32 bit integers but in general when we are dealing with signal processing systems you can't just assume that everything is a 32 bit integer you might not want 32 bit integers you might want a different number of bits more importantly you might find that integers alone are not sufficient you actually want to work with something which has fractional values as well okay how do i do that that's basically the question that we need to answer okay so first things first let's look at what the binary number system allows us to do if i have a number like 0110 right effectively what that is saying is this corresponds to the 2 power 0 this one corresponds to 2 power 1 this corresponds to 2 power 2 and this corresponds to 2 power 3 when i say corresponds to effectively what i'm saying is they will be multiplied by those values and the result will be added up together okay which means that in this case i'll basically get 0 plus 2 plus 4 plus 0 equal to 6 <coughs> right so 0 1 1 0 in binary in other words represents the decimal value 6 okay we can extend this to any number of bits that we want what happens for negative numbers the simplest solution would have been if i could use a different symbol to indicate a minus sign and say okay this is minus 0110 right the problem is when i'm working inside a computer i have only two logic states i have a logic low and a logic high as it is i'm trying to use two states that were designed for representing logic functionality in order to represent numbers that was not what they were originally designed to do right but i can still get the same functionality i can get i can use zeros and ones in order to represent numbers the tricky part over here is how do i represent negative numbers okay so here we follow certain conventions you have to have a mutual understanding between the person who is writing the number and the person who is reading it otherwise i'll read it wrong and get the wrong result okay the convention that we use is if the number is negative and i'm using n bits right i will represent 2 power n plus x okay what exactly does this mean let's say n is equal to 4 and x is equal to minus 6 right what i'll do over here is i will rather than trying to represent minus 6 directly as a number i will say i'm going to represent 2 power 4 plus minus 6 2 power 4 is 16 so 16 minus 6 is equal to 10 that's the decimal value which when i represent basically comes out to be 1010 in binary okay now i can look at this and i can say this is a negative number with the value minus 6 okay why am i able to say that because i am following a convention the convention that i am following over here is a that i am using only four bits to represent numbers and b that i am using something called the twos complement representation right so this is essentially something called the twos complement right the fact that we obtain it by doing you know inverting all the bits and adding one is irrelevant what is actually important is that we are actually storing 2 power n plus x right it turns out that two's complement basically inverting all the bits and adding one is an easy way of computing two's complement for binary numbers 
but that's not the reason why we use it the reason why we use it is because it's 2 power n plus x okay why is that useful because it also helps us when we try to do certain other kinds of computations in particular supposing i wanted to do x is equal to plus 6 y is equal to minus 4 and i wanted to do x plus y right what i'm going to do is this will be stored directly as the binary equivalent of plus 6 this will be stored as the binary equivalent of 2 power 6 or uh, 2 power 4 minus 4 right so 16 minus 4 12 okay so effectively what i have is 6 plus 2 power 4 minus 4 Okay, where 2 power 4 minus 4 is somehow being represented as one number and the result that I'll get when I do this will be 2 power 4 plus 6 minus 4 okay what is 2 power 4 if I represent this in binary it's going to be 1 0 0 0 0 okay if I look only at the bottom four bits the ones that I am concerned about it actually will give me the 6 minus 4 and this the extra bit the fifth bit corresponds to the 2 power 4 <coughs> okay which I can just basically ignore and carry on right in other words implicitly by using the 2's complement representation my addition that I operation that I did over here is able to perform a subtraction I don't need to implement a separate piece of hardware in order to do subtraction. All I need to do is complement the value to make it negative, which can be done using reasonably simple hardware and then use a regular adder. Okay. All right. So far, so good. We understand why we need to have two's complement. Okay. But the main question that we are interested in answering is integers are not enough right what if I want to save a number like or rather represent a number like pi to four decimals it's 3.1415 what should I do How do I convert this into an integer? Right? Because at the end of the day, in some sense, what we are saying is the only way that I can really store anything in binary, it's going to be integers. Okay? So I will have to once again use a new convention. Just like I had a convention that said two's complement allows me to represent negative numbers. Now I need a new convention. One that says if I want to represent a real valued number. I have to somehow convert it into an integer okay so what are the ways let's stick with decimal for now not worry about binary okay one way that I could write this is this is equal to 3 the closest integer or I could write it as 31 by 10 okay where the by 10 is hidden away so that effectively the value that I will store is 31 and I will say there is a scaling factor okay so the by 10 the 10 basically becomes a scaling factor that I am not going to always make explicit that is part of the convention right anybody who sees a 31 as long as you know that my scaling factor that I am using over here is 10 you know that the value that I am actually trying to represent is 3.1 okay so instead I could also, also write it as 31415 with my scaling factor as 10 power 4 okay so effectively in other words what it's telling you is if you can decide on a scaling factor right 
both the person who is writing the number and the person who is reading it as long as they both agree on the same scaling factor you can basically convert all numbers to integers round them off to that number of digits and you are done okay so 31 would basically be to one significant digit right pi to one significant digit 31415 is pi to whatever five significant digits basically four uh, fractional places with a scaling factor of 10 power 4 okay but if there is confusion if the person who is writing it writes 31415 and the person who is reading it thinks that the scaling factor is 10 you are going to get the wrong value okay so that thing of what is the notation how are you actually representing the numbers has to be very clear from both sides okay so this part of it how do i sort of use this scaling factor right and use it in order to represent that i am using a certain kind of uh, represent a certain form of number is something that is important for us to keep in mind and that's basically allows us to i can do the same thing in binary right what i would do in binary is i could have a number like 0110.1010 right effectively what this is saying is the number that would be stored is 0110.1010 and a scaling factor of 2 power minus 4 right so the scaling factor of 2 power minus 4 essentially says i will take this value and multiply it by s equal to 2 power minus 4 in order to get the actual value that I am representing. Okay, If I want to find out the actual true value of this, this would basically come down to, there are two ways of finding it out, you know this corresponds to 2 power 0, this corresponds to 2 power 1 etc. the same way, this corresponds to 2 power minus 1, 2 power minus 2, 2 power minus 3, 2 power minus 4. Right? So that this one basically becomes 0 0.5, this becomes 0 0.125. Right? So what I have is 6.625 is what is being represented over there. Right? The other way of looking at it is I take the entire number that I have over here, right? which basically becomes if I look at this number it would be I think this is somewhere around 106 or something like that. the decimal value into 2 power minus 4. You will get exactly the same value out here. right? So in other words, this representation that I have over here it is just an 8 bit representation. It does not show any binary point, no other digits over there is sufficient to tell, to tell me that the value is actually 6.625 provided that at the other end I also understand that this is what I am trying to convey, right? that I am using a scale factor of 2 power minus 4. Okay? So this convention of what scaling factor I am going to use can be used in order to represent real valued numbers or at least fractional valued numbers, not all real numbers but at least some range of fractional values. Alright, we will stop here for now. Tomorrow we will continue with this and extend it to other kinds of numbers, not in different kinds of so-called fixed point numbers as well as a different representation where the scaling factor itself is carried along with the number which is floating point.